Everyone say faith. faith. Turn to your neighbor with a big smile, with a big grunt and go faith. faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says this. Now faith is this confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. I love the NKJV version which says, now faith is the substance. It's felt. It's something that you experience, so to speak, in your gut. A belief that's something that feels like a strong belief that you know without a shadow of a doubt. It's more than hope. Hope is just like, oh, it would be nice. It would be nice if things turned out like this. Faith believes it can turn out like this. Faith is a substance that God has declared according to His Word, things will work. And so therefore, in these next few minutes, I'm praying that you will be convinced. First, let's, first of all, let's establish a principle in context of faith. Let's establish, can we agree that God wants to financially bless you? Can we move to a place of agreement that according to the Word of God, I'm not talking about everyone necessarily being millionaires. You can actually, that comes actually in a lot of ways out of your own faith. But what I do believe according to His Word over and over and over again in Scripture is repeated that God wants to financially bless you, I. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Verse 10, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And you're stepping out in our stepping out to be financial contributors towards this. I believe God is able to provide the seed that you need to be involved. Now let's just another scripture again. Uh, Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22 says this, The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth. You know, more often than not, when we talk about blessings, we think of spiritual stuff or just a nice life, a happy life. But can I suggest to you from the Word of God, not just suggest to you, but point out to you that the blessing of the Lord will also bring wealth. Who wants to be blessed? All right, okay. Uh, this is how you say yes. He goes in there. Who wants to be blessed? Yeah. Hey, believe it or not, it's actually an important decision. Because there's a psyche in us that if we feel that we are not worthy, I actually don't even agree that I can be blessed. So therefore, the faith component is so important in this context of a knowledge that says God wants to bless me. It's not about what my circumstances look right now. In fact, in some ways, your circumstances right now might be trying to pull up a faith in you that says, come on, we're going to declare to this thing that all things work together for good for them who love God and are called according to His purposes. So could you turn with me right now to 1 Kings chapter 17? And I will try to make this reasonably quick. So he's... 1 Kings chapter 17. And I want to show you this again in the context. But let me say this. God wants you to win. I have no shadows of a doubt in saying that statement. God wants you to win. He wants you to win in life. God is for us, for you. God is for you. I, I wish I could prophesy it over and over and over and over again till it just like it's so ingrained in your psyche that you would understand that no matter what circumstances around you, God is for you. In fact, circumstances are going to shift. They're going to be better. They're going to turn around. Because of the fact, again, that God is for you. So help me out for a moment. This is the last thing I, I think I'm going to ask you to do. <laughs> right now, the last bit of preaching, help me to preach. Turn to the person and say, God is for you. Person on the other side, now say this, God is for me. How'd you go with that statement? Did you hear the ring of that one? Not just God is for you, but to say God is for me. Passage of Scripture we're about to look at deals with two characters. The first one is Elijah the prophet. This guy is, is the man of God. He, he says things. Uh, he declares that things are going to happen. They happen. He, he is known for having such a relationship with God that it says Elijah did not see death. But God actually came and took him so that he did not experience death. Such a relationship, a connection that he had, a belief, faith with God. 
The second person who's in this piece of history is a widow. She's not even an Israelite. So at the end of the day, this widow, she ha- and she has so little, as you're going to discover in this piece of history. She has so little, she has nothing, and she's not even an Israelite. So in our context, not even a believer. So let's see what 1 Kings chapter 17 says about these two and the story that we're about to unveil. Reading from verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbite in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Again, he'd declare things, they would happen. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan and you will drink from the brook. And I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. God gives Elijah a plan on how to be provided for. He has to move from one place to another, and there he's going to experience the supernatural provision of God. God can provide for you supernaturally. I'm not so sure though how comfortable I would be with this version of supernatural provision. Ravens bringing you bread and meat. Do we have any germophobics in the room? Is anyone like me where you just read this story and just go like, I'm not so sure I could even just do that. Ravens are known as scavenger birds. So a scavenger bird is bringing you bread and meat. I'm just going like, what else has been in that bird's beak? But in light of this, it says that God supernaturally provides for Elijah. He brings provision for him. But for that to happen in the first place, there was first of all something required of Elijah. He had to follow the plan. He actually had to do it, to put it into place. For those of you, again, doing financial fitness and in the Connect Group series, you will be doing, you'll be visiting information that will give you the ability to create plans of how to create a financial future. But again, it's one thing to create a plan. It's another thing to put the plan in place. It is always part of the Christian journey. God gives us the Bible, the Word of God, to give us instructions on how to do life well. But the way that life comes well is our ability to follow the plan. Everyone say, follow the plan. What the plan? I've got the plan, now follow the plan. (laughs) Let's read on with it. Verse chapter seven, it says, Sometime later the brook dried up, and because there had been no rain in the land, then the word of the Lord came to him. Verse nine, Elijah, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. God will always go ahead of you. Trust in this. God is always going ahead of you. Let's read to verse 10. So he went to Zarephath, he followed the plan. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and bring me please a piece of bread. The widow turned to look at him. As surely as your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour, and a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. This widow, her situation was pretty desperate. The famine that Elijah himself, this was the guy who declared, who had actually literally declared that the drought would come. And she's now the victim of it. And her situation is so desperate with so little. And she has a plan. But her plan is the opposite of what we pray of anybody else in this place. Her plan was simply to gather the little that she had and to die. That is not the plan, everybody. That is not the plan. The power of finances, unfortunately, can create such a desperation in people. And it's why, again, that we as the church, we need to be able to breathe hope and talk about money and finances. It should not be a taboo subject of the church. It should be something that we can give air to, that we can give space to, because we as people, we need to have hope created in us, not just hope, but faith in us, that our financial world can actually be blessed, that our financial world can move ahead. 
because the power of finances and the stress of it, the distress of it, caused in this woman that her plan was that my life of me and my son is over. Can I tell you today, that's the, not the kind of news you're going to hear in this place. You're going to hear good news in this place. You're not just going to hear good news in this place. You're going to hear good news in the Word of God. You're going to hear good news when you go to God. Our God is a God of good news. So now let's listen to what happens next. So Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will never be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord, the day that the Lord sends rain on the land. Now let's see if I can help you understand the picture of this. Remember, Elijah shows up and he's been following the plan. Everyone say the plan. The plan is whether we like it or not, but he has had supernatural provision of bread and meat. So he's probably not looking overly starved. In fact, he's probably looking a little bit like I felt when I got off a cruise. I went on a cruise just recently and they actually reckon within seven days, the average punter puts on around about two and a half kilograms. I'm pretty sure I helped that average go up a little bit. <laughs> Elijah shows up and he's looking well. He's looking well nourished. He's looking well fed. And he's asking this woman, who I'm pretty confident again, that it should have been rationing out her supplies for such a long period of time to try and make it last. I'm pretty confident that from a weight point, she's, she's looking skinny, she's looking scrawn. She's looking literally like the picture that she has in her mind of that this is it, I'm going to die. And yet this well-fed prophet, this guy who's looking nice and wealthy, healthy and all this sort of stuff, he has the audacity after hearing from her that she's about to cook her last to still ask the question, but would you still give for me a loaf of bread? Would you still, for me, bring something? You know, it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to say something nice to someone, isn't it? It's easy to go when you hear someone tell their story and hear their sense of desperation to go, hey, it's all okay. It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be nice. You're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. You're gonna, it's, things are going to be right. But the difficulty with words is that more often than not, well, what's your substance for saying those words? You don't know my situation. You don't know how desperate it really is. Okay, maybe you've heard me, but I don't think you still get it. It's not just going to be okay. It's not just about to work out. I can't see the way forward. And that's why I so believe that we as the church are good news people. Because our word of it's going to be all right is not just based on a nice little feeling. Our base word base of saying it's going to be all right, it's all going to work, is based on a foundation. It's called the Word of God, everybody. The Word of God says all things are going to work for you. And so this lady, this lady in her desperate situation, all of a sudden she's not just hearing a, a plea from someone who's looking good. She's literally hearing from the voice of God, so to speak. She's hearing from the man of God who says, there is a plan for me to be well fed and you're part of it. And the word of the Lord is coming to you now that says that even though your situation looks bleak, even though your situation looks desperate, I'm telling you, there is a supernatural provision coming for you. There is a supernatural plan coming for you. That as you would give unction unto the word of God, something's going to change in your circumstances. Let me be uh, vulnerable for a moment. Let me bear my soul. Is that okay? Everyone got tissues? No, you won't need them. It's not that bad. You know, what we were embarking on with the purchase of this site, there's a little bit of in me about this. You know, again, at the end of the day, look, I appreciate we have a board, but I have that feeling every so often, the buck stops with me, hey. I'm the one who kind of has the, <laughs> the privilege to make decisions on behalf of all of us about our way forward. 
I'm going to tell you in the direction that we're going right now, it's a step. It's a, it's a, I got to say in the last couple of weeks, I came home from holidays and I was just like super relaxed. Thank you for allowing me to have holidays. We were so blessed in the sense that again, some gifts that we would received allowed us to have like, we again, we had, we had a great holiday and I came home feeling really relaxed. But then I came home and, you know, some team had been doing some work around about the figures and that sort of stuff about what it's going to take to do this and to take this place and that sort of stuff and a few other circumstances. And I'll tell you what, within that first week of being home, my relaxation disappeared very quickly. <laughs> my sense of calmness was just suddenly like going, ah! One of the practices of, of, I pray that is in your life, not just as a pastor, but as an individual, that you would have a connection and a commitment to the Word of God. Because the Word of God has the ability to create something more than just hope. It has the ability to create faith. Everyone say faith. Put your hand on your heart. Close your eyes. Say faith. Do you feel it? Because you need to. Faith will do something inside of you that when you allow the Word of God, to pronounce the plan inside of you. In that week when I was starting to take all that stuff to God and go, hey God, what's the plan? Um, this, I was reading through the Word of God and this scripture came, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 3 to 4, and it says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, and then, the Bible's so filled with conditions. And if you will give ear to the conditions, put the conditions in place, then you can begin to walk with a foundation, not with just a nice hope, that, not just nice words, but a foundation that shifts things and moves things for your future. For then you will win favour and a good name in the sight of God and man. When I read that scripture throughout this last, in that week, something clicked on the inside and I just went, hold on, that's my story. I'm a man given unto the Word. I'm a man given unto its Word and its promises and therefore writing it as much as I can on the tablet of my heart, so to speak, that it becomes part of my confession, not just my confession, but how I do things. Right. So therefore, if this is the promise, and therefore it's then like I heard the whisper that says, and therefore, Brian, I favour you and I will give you favour with me and with men. And all of a sudden, all the fears just went, did you hear that? Did you hear the voice? of God. Did you hear fears? Did you hear the voice of God and what it says about those fears? Do you know the meaning of the word? You know, there's an anagram for the word fear. It's, a, it's put like this. Fear is false expectations appearing real. So many of our fears aren't even based on what's happened yet. It may never even happen. They are false expectations. So much of our feelings of anxiety, etc., aren't even based on real things. They're based on what our story, our mind tells of those things. So you need to hear a different story. You need to hear a different story. This lady began to hear a different story. She began to hear a story that if she would actually make a meal for the prophet, that if she would commit to the fact of caring for him even before herself, then the place of the thing of flour and the jar of oil, that which was needed to create bread and sustenance, will never run dry till the day of drought. And so supernatural promise. So the prophet begins to declare, and the word of God wants to begin to declare to you, the plan has changed, baby. <laughs> the plan is not the plan of desperation. The plan is not the plan of bad news, but there is a plan of good news for you. There is a plan from the word of God that wants to declare good news to you. And I believe that there is a plan that God wants to declare to our city and our region. There are multitudes upon multitudes in the valley of decision. We are going to see not just but one person come to Christ every week, but there will come Sundays when we cannot count. We cannot predict the amount of people who are giving their life to Jesus Christ. There is such a revival that we've heard in the words of Pastor Phil, but I believe even to us here in Tasmania, 
that we are going to see a revival that is beyond what we can ask or imagine. And there needs to be places to house it. There is no building big enough to house the revival that is coming to our region. All the churches in our city are going to be full over and above. And therefore, our service, our church, well, what can I tell you? But get ready. Get ready. Because this is not just, again, for a certain few. Every one of us are going to play a part. Every one of us are called to be disciple makers. Every one of us, God will equip us. And we're not called, that doesn't mean every one of us becomes someone on the stage. But it means every one of us is going to find a way to just help someone take that next step towards Jesus. That next step towards discovering their Bible. That next step to discovering the Word of God, how it creates faith, how it creates the plan. This is the last time. Turn your neighbor and help me out. You go, God has a plan for me. And now, now prophesy to someone else around you. Therefore, God has a plan for you. <laughs> All right, let me finish with this. Let me finish with this. You're such an amazing church. You really are. And what God is doing amongst us, your attentiveness, what we are stepping into is not a burden, but a privilege. What we are stepping into because what I'm asking you to do, and again, as a pastor, can I tell you, I, I, you know, I, there's so many things in me right now that I just could be that, uh, where I just go, no, hold on, God is with us. God is for us. And I'm asking you with, to join with Pastor Sharon and myself that over these next two weeks, you would get before God and that you would discover His plan for you. His plan for you, number one, in putting your own plan together financially, but also to discover His voice in how He would have you help here how you would be committed here financially that we might do, that we might purchase, that we may no longer give finances out to someone else and still someone else tell us what we can or cannot do with this space, but that we would get to the point where we would become landowners, that we would take ground, that we would take dominion. And I, again, I know that this is a sacrifice that I'm asking you to do. But I tell you what, the key to this lady's provision and it was a supernatural provision. God is able to do more than you can ask or imagine. But the thing that set this whole situation up was this. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Oh man, how many times I feel like I need to say that right now. How many people I feel like I need to say that with right now. Don't be afraid. Hear that. The voice of the Spirit says, don't be afraid. The voice of God says to you, don't be afraid. Fear not. 365 times, apparently it's written in the Bible, one for every day of the year, fear not. Go home and do as you've said, but first. There is a putting of God first. When we discover the power of God first, it's amazing what follows. The greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your, with all your, with all your, this is the greatest commandment. Yes, we're called to reach the world. Yes, we're called to serve one another. But the first and foremost that we are called to do is love God first. 